At that time, Jesus took Peter and James and John, his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart, was transfigured before them. Words taken from the gospel today for this second Sunday in Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sometime after St. John Bosco had established his home for wayward boys in Turin, his own dear saintly mother Margaret worked with him in keeping these little urchins properly fed and clothed. Yet one day she came into his office crying out, I can't do this anymore. You see all the trouble I take, and yet nothing comes of it. I can't stand these boys. Today I find all the washing I had hung up trampled on the ground. Yesterday they ran over all my vegetable garden. Some come back at night with their clothes all in rags, others without neckties or shoes or handkerchiefs. Some of them hide their shirts, others take my saucepans to play with. It takes hours to find all these things. I've had enough of it. I've had enough of it, I tell you. I can't go on any longer. And just think how quiet I was at home in Betchy, doing my spinning. Let me go back to end my days there. Don Bosco made no reply. He simply pointed to the crucifix hanging on the wall. Mother Margaret understood, and her eyes filled with tears. You are right. You are right, she said. And then she went down and put on her apron. The Desert Fathers teach us this important fact. Demons cannot easily find an entrance into the heart, the mind, or body of anyone, nor have they the power of overwhelming the soul of anyone, unless, unless... They have first deprived it of all holy thoughts and made it empty and free from spiritual meditation. As from the fathers of the church, desert fathers, the desert fathers always stress the need for Christian meditation in overcoming devils and their wiles. Christian meditation, what is that? That is reflecting on a mystery of Christ and making it real to ourselves, conversing about this mystery with God in prayer, quietly, interiorly, not vocally. How much more is this true today, then, this need for Christian meditation to keep the devil at arm's length when we have the rising tide of the occult in our world? Wicca is the fourth largest religion in America now. The devil has his contemplatives too. We have many that are meditating today on things of the world like movies, smartphones. They're always meditating on something. Facebook and all the social media. According to the fathers, the doctors, and the saints, this Christian meditation that we need should most especially be focused on the passion of our Lord and Savior. It's proven to be the most powerful in keeping the devil away and breaking man free from sin. You can just imagine the ease the devil has with so many people meditating on the wrong things, practicing a worldly, even diabolical meditation, rather than a Christian meditation. Once again, the fathers say that demons cannot easily find an entrance into the mind, the heart, or body of anyone, nor have they the power of overwhelming the soul of anyone unless they have first deprived it of all holy thoughts and made it empty and free from spiritual meditation. Now, this is precisely one reason why we arrive at the transfiguration on Mount Tabor the second Sunday of Lent. Last Sunday was the devil, tempting. This Sunday, we're at Tabor. We have the means to overcome him. What are those means? Well, St. Luke recounts of the transfiguration in his gospel. He says, His majesty and his chosen disciples went up into a mountain to pray. 
they went up there to pray, to meditate with his majesty, these disciples. And as they prayed, St. Luke says, behold, two men were talking with him. And they were Moses and Elias appearing in majesty. And they spoke of his decease, excessum in the Latin, his departure, his exodus from this world that he should accomplish in Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9. Now, obviously, these two great ones, Moses and Elias, were meditating with his majesty on his passion. That's what they were doing before he himself entered into this, his hour. In other words, even in good times, and being on Mount Tabor is good times. That's why he wanted, St. Peter wanted to build three tents. Let's keep the good times going. Let's stay here. So even in good times, that is being with our Lord on Mount Tabor, we must meditate upon the passion if we're going to make it. If we have to go back down into that valley, which we all do when we leave the doors of this church today, we need to be fortified by the power given us by God through the passion. Everyone knows that we ourselves will be exiting this world sooner or later. We're all going to die. To make it home to heaven safely, we must pass through Calvary and die with Christ so that we can rise with Christ and live with him forever. Thus the reason for meditating, making real to ourselves the passion. Now, We can see the power of this. Let's think about it. Why did God choose Moses and Elias to appear with him on Mount Tabor? Because they did this very thing in their lives. They meditated upon the passion. Moses saw the passion and meditated upon it often as he wrote the five books, the first five books of the Bible. Yes, he is their author. It had one author, God, and the second author, the human author, is Moses, as Jesus himself tells us. Now, we know from this book, these five books, there's many references to the passion. Here's a couple. Noah's Ark coming down on a mountaintop from whence water and blood flowed as the side of the ark opened and out came the life of the world. Our Lord is the ark and from his side opened up came blood and water down a mountain. Abraham sacrificing Isaac bound on wood that Isaac himself carried up the mountain, just like our Lord carried the cross to the top of the mountain, but was saved at the last moment by an angel. Isaac was remember there was a replacement sacrifice provided a lamb caught in the wood of a tree representing the Christ dying on the mountain in the future. He saw a vision of Christ's day and he marveled. Don't you think Moses understood what that vision was when he wrote that? Third of all, how about Joseph, the patriarch? He was imprisoned with two other men. One died. He was like the bad thief. And one lived being released with Joseph. He was the good thief. Not to mention Moses meditating on things of time and eternity from the mountains of Sinai and Horeb. And is spreading out his arms in the shape of a cross, holding the wood of the cross in his hands, splitting the Red Sea and working all sorts of miracles and defeating the Amalekites down in the valley below. Moses understood what these things meant. And finally, the fending off of the seraph serpents with the bronze serpent on a tree. Moses meditated upon the passion. Elias saw the passion, the acceptable sacrifice that required blood and water on the top of Mount Carmel. The sacrifice that put an end to all Jezebel's false prophets and their false religions. He again contemplated the passion as he longed to die below a tree in the desert and was given life-giving bread and told to climb the mountain and meditate once again with God. Each of these men did great and memorable works that are still admired to this day. Elias is scheduled even to return near the end of time to do even more in confronting the Antichrist. How did these men do this? One could say that each of them not only meditated upon the passion of Christ that was going to happen in the future, in other words, according to his own time, place, and position, 
but also shared, shared in his passion as well. This is how they did it. Saints found this to be true as well. If you've ever read about victim souls like St. Lydon of Shadim, she's 15th century, and Blessed Alexandrina da Costa, 20th century, victim souls, were finally able to accept their suffering. This is unbelievable suffering they went through. And they used it for good only after spending time meditating on the passion of His Majesty. Then... They suddenly soared up into the heights of the spiritual life. Marvel to read about. St. Teresa of Jesus struggled with her spiritual life for some 20 years. Only after begging for grace to weep over his majesty's passion. Did she receive a grace looking at a bust of the Ecce Homo. Then she rapidly became the church's mystical doctor. St. Margaret Mary hesitated entering the convent until His Majesty appeared to her in his scourging. Then she entered and received the visions of the Sacred Heart. St. Padre Pio relived the Passion many times to gain countless souls for God through the confessional or even through bilocation. In a word, men and women became saints through the meditating on the passion of our Lord. And they helped others to become saints as well. At the end of time, His Majesty tells us that His cross will appear in the sky as a sign. Listen to one author describe this amazing reality. He says, all the fathers concur in interpreting this sign which will appear in the sky at the end of time will be displayed in the heavens as the cross of Christ. Although the cross whereon our Lord suffered is now divided into innumerable little pieces, even particles, yet by divine power it will once more form a complete whole, not a sliver shall be lost. In other words, the sign you're going to see is literally the cross that Christ died on. It will be carried down from heaven by the angels with solemn pomp. And it will be glowing with magnificence. And the angels who bear it will be followed by others who, as the angelic doctor St. Thomas Aquinas maintains, will carry all the other instruments of the passion. That is to say, the pillar, the lance, the scourges, the hammer, the dice, the scarlet robe, the white robe, the seamless tunic, the holy winding sheet the vessel containing myrrh, and all the other instruments that were employed during the Passion. And the object of this will be to make manifest to the whole world how many and how manifold were the pains Christ suffered for our sake. His whole Passion will seem to be reenacted before them. Amazing. Thank you. It's excellent. Sooner or later, everyone will have to meditate upon the Passion. It's unavoidable. And this is how the world ends. So it must be very important. Calvary is the greatest display of God's power in vanquishing evil. In hulk signo vinces, in this sign you shall conquer. This is precisely why we represent, we make present again at every mass, Calvary. The passion. On the other hand, those who resist this mystery, they fall apart. They fail. Their heads are crushed. Think about it. Even good people, after being made the first pope and given the keys of the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, St. Peter tried to stop his majesty from going to Golgotha. Our Lord turned to him and said, Go behind me, Satan. Thou art a scandal unto me, because thou savorest not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. Wow. One could argue that the cause of this was simply Peter refused to meditate upon the passion. After the Last Supper on Mount Olivet, they were just ordained bishops. They'd received Holy Communion, the first in the world to receive Holy Communion. 
The apostles slept and ended up running away and abandoning our Lord and betraying him and denying him. What happened? What happened? Why did they fail? They failed to meditate upon the passion when they had a chance. They fell asleep instead. How many times did our Lord say, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Taking up our cross is best done alongside frequent meditation on the passion in order to appreciate its value, its worth, its necessity. Now, if you're not convinced yet, finally, we have the words of St. Paul where he is in tears because so many, quote, conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ, end quote. It seems St. Paul meditated frequently upon the passion so often, as it were, that he could say, quote, I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus in my body, end quote. In another place, he says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. The imitation of Christ says, if you cannot contemplate high and heavenly things, take refuge in the passion of Christ and love to dwell within his sacred wounds. For if you devoutly seek the wounds of Jesus and the precious marks of his passion, you will find great strength in all troubles. Through all this, we see that meditating upon the passion can do great things, namely Open a path for us to talk openly and plainly with our God about his saving mysteries, enabling us to take greater advantage of them, producing fruits, virtue, patience, especially. And finally, even the fruit of salvation. We can join Moses and Elias in making the passion of our blessed Lord real to ourselves through accompanying him in the stations of the cross. In the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, prayed with some care, prayerfully reading the passion accounts in the four gospels, as well as Isaiah's chapter 53, wisdom chapter two, and Psalm 21, to name only a few. We should be doing these things, meditating frequently, using the scriptures upon the passion. When we do this, the devil will be kept at bay. Temptations will be conquered. Sin will be avoided. We will endure suffering patiently. We will grow in the spiritual life and will be ready to die with him on Calvary so that we can rise with him and live with him forever in heaven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.